I'm your host, John Bruni. Welcome to The Focus, where we bring you the most thought-provoking and informative current affairs analysis from around the world. Each episode, we invite top experts and analysts to share their insights on the most pressing issues of our time. From international relations and global economics to philosophy and science, no topic is off limits. Join us as we explore the complex and ever-changing landscape of the world, where we provide valuable perspectives on the events that shape our global community. For the past 20 years now, September September 11th has come to be known as the date that kicked off the global war on terrorism. However, prior to this event, September 11th, 1973 was a date associated with the death of democracy in the Latin American country of Chile. Today, we'll be talking about something that hasn't been given much airtime, especially in Australia, the 50-year commemoration of the 1973 Chilean coup, which saw the toppling of Chile's democratically elected president, Salvador Allende. Joining us for this discussion from Sydney is Dr. Rodrigo Acuna. Rodrigo's research interests include inter-American relations, Cold War and post-Cold War Latin America, Venezuelan history and politics, human rights and development policies. And from Darwin in the Northern Territory, we're joined by Professor Clinton Fernandez. Clinton is an Australian historian and academic who is Professor of International and Political Studies at the University of New South Wales in Canberra, part of the Australian Defence Force Academy by Old Alma Mater. His work is primarily concerned with Australia's national security, in particular intelligence matters. But before we start, a shameless plug for ourselves. Please subscribe to our channel. We need the algorithm to find us. And by hitting the subscribe and like buttons, this is your contribution to the growth of what hopefully will become a South Australian global sensation. Rodrigo and Clinton, thank you for joining us on The Focus. Good to be with you, John. Thanks for the opportunity. Now, Clinton, can you provide some historical context about the events leading up to the Chilean military coup on September 11, 1973? The basic facts are as follows. Uh, Chile is a wealthy country, uh, you know, unique and beautiful. It starts at the, uh, uh, in the desert, the Atacama Desert at the top, it goes through, uh, you know, beautiful grasslands, agriculture, all the way down to Antarctica. Uh, it's very rich in natural resources, in particular copper. Unfortunately, uh, for most of the 50s, 60s, um, and early 70s, the copper resources were under the control of two American corporations, Kennecott, copper and anaconda copper. And there had been discussions about how can Chile actually get control of its own resources uh, because you know it needs it in order to uh, develop its own economy. And uh, the, the person of, of interest we're talking about today is uh, Dr. Salvador Allende. He's a pediatrician. And uh, I've, I've likened him in the past to the Bernie Sanders of Chile. You know, he, he ran for president in 1950 to 1958, they have six year terms. Uh, and in 1958, he came very close to actually winning the presidency in his, in his own right. I mean, it was just three points uh, with, with another candidate that uh, stopped him from doing that. And uh, 64, he ran again. And on this, that occasion, the United States secretly funded 50% uh, of his opponent's election campaign in order to defeat Allende, because uh, they wanted control of Chile's copper. 1970, he finally won. He came first at the head of a three-cornered race. And uh, immediately after that, the United States decided it had to get rid of him. Uh, there were representations from Chilean oligarchs uh, who can, you know, who were, whose own position inside Chile relied on the American system of imperial control. And so the president at the time, Richard Nixon, and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, they were... Uh, I mean, of course, they thought about uh, copper and, and uh, Kennecott and Anaconda, but their real concern, we now know through the declassified record, was they had an imperial view of American foreign policy. Their real concern was what would the effect be on uh, in other parts of the world, uh, elsewhere in Latin America, but also in Europe, 
if Chile began to take control of its own resources, because independent economic nationalism was a threat if you believe that the resources of a country ought to be made available to your corporations in the manner desired by your corporations. Now, an independent economic nationalist is as bad, as far as the Americans are concerned, um, as a communist, because it has the same effect, right? Uh, and so they decided to get rid of him. Now, uh, the obstacle was a very conservative but very honorable head of the military, General René Schneider. And he didn't want to have anything to do with a coup. So when the United States decided to move against uh, Allende, he was the obstacle. And so the coup plotters, armed by the CIA, funded by them, uh, they tried to disarm René Schneider, kidnap him, and take him across uh, to Argentina, where there'd been a previous coup, uh, military dictatorship. And uh, he resisted. And in the in the in the exchange, he was shot. That brought all the Chileans out on the streets because they were appalled at the chief of their military being being killed. And so it became very hard to then get rid of Allende. So what the United States decided to do was set up a coup climate. The words coup climate come up all the time in the classified records, which is now declassified. They wanted to make the economy scream. They wanted to make it ungovernable, right? That's the, that's the lead in to the CIA requesting Australia to send its own intelligence agency to assist the CIA as a go-between between itself and the coup plotters and to help it create a coup climate. I think that's that's a relevant background. Excellent, thanks, uh, Rodrigo. Do you have anything else to add to what Clinton's just said? Clinton's absolutely on on point. That coup, coup climate is what allowed the military to eventually organize itself and and carry out the coup d'état with the support of of the United States. And for people that actually lived through that period, one of the observations which is really important is how shortly after the coup was successful only a matter of uh, days and week or so the supermarkets the shelves on the supermarkets were stocked once again so it proved the argument of the popular unity government that key set a key um supermarket chains throughout the country were hoarding food in order to damage the allende government and um you know then you have mass repression, which is taking place after the coup, but you have the supermarket shelves, which are now full because the, the hoarding has stopped. Mm. Rodrigo, the uh, Pinochet regime is estimated to have killed over 3,000 people and subjected tens of thousands to internment and torture. Can you elaborate on the human rights violations committed during this period? They were absolutely atrocious. The amount of, of people that were executed just within the first few weeks of the of the coup it's estimated about a thousand Chileans were executed in Santiago alone and the the full force of the the Chilean military and then eventually the police intelligence which was reshaped under Pinochet with the support of the CIA when I'm talking about the 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 Dina the National Directorate of Intelligence and they proceeded to carry out vast human rights violations. So the members of the military who were loyal to the constitution a few weeks before the coup took place, they were arrested. And uh, during the coup, then they went, they were either tortured or went missing. The, the famous case of uh, General Bachelet, um, I think he might have been a major um, at the time. And uh, he, he was the father of the former president, Michel Bachelet. And now that 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 element within the Chilean military was was a minority, but they were there. They 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 believed in respecting the constitution and allowing Allende's government to to fulfill its its mandate, and then either win the next election or be voted out of office. But uh, General Pinochet was was not playing by the rules, and he then proceeded to outmaneuver the other members of the junta, and then accumulate power and, and, and become the most powerful man in the country together with uh, Manuel Contreras, who was the head of the of the, the DINA. And yes, the, the human rights uh, violations that were carried out were atrocious. We're talking about anything between people being arrested and beaten to people being interrogated under torture through the use of electricity, uh, through the use of... Uh, Police dogs, which were trained to to rape uh, people that 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 were detained, um, all all sorts of horrific abuses were were carried out, 
And then I guess one of the the worst was disappearing people. So mm -hmm. taking them on board helicopters and, and throwing them into into the ocean. That was much more practiced in Argentina during the Argentine military dictatorship, but the Chileans did it as well. And that then creates a sense of enormous loss for the relatives because they don't have anywhere they can go and, and mourn their dead. They mm -hmm. simply, the, the, the dead have now disappeared and there, there's no physical uh, trace. And occasionally, once every couple of years, there is a common grave found in, in Chile, like in many other parts of Latin America where US dictatorships were active. And people will travel there and, and, and then they'll, you know, wait for the the uh, forensic uh, experts to to go through the the remains and then and if the remains are identified that they are their 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 relatives and they'll proceed to to host uh, you know funerals and all the burial rites rodrigo how have the survivors and families of the victims coped with the trauma and injustice from the pinochet era over the past 50 years are the wounds from this period properly closed now and clinton please feel free to to jump in if you if you have something to say about this too I, I don't think the wounds are properly healed. You, there are certain th boundaries, there are certain lines that you don't cross, and once you cross those lines, then it's it's almost impossible to come back from from that. So, just to give you a, an an example, I, I have many uh, family uh, friends that uh, suffered the impact of, of of the dictatorship, and they, for example, one uh, lady. Her two brothers were part of the president of President Allende's personal security team, and one of them was arrested and and disappeared on the day or the, the next day after the coup d'état, and until this day he's never been found. So his sister uh, travels to Chile every few years when one of these common graves are uncovered, and she's there to try and and see if if her brother has been identified. Now her other brother who was also part of the presidential guard, uh, the president's security team, he survived, but he was tortured in such a hideous manner that he has been disabled. Uh, he, he's, he's disabled and she has cared for him for many decades now. They're both still alive and he has trouble communicating. Uh, she almost acts like a translator for him. And, you know, this is these are just cases of, you know, thousands, thousands of Chileans. Um, the Allende family, we had the the grandson of the president, um, Alejandro Allende, present at the New South Wales Parliament yesterday. And before that, he had a meeting at the New South Wales Teachers Federation, and he spoke of how three members of his uh, family committed suicide, including his mother. So people that were that were tortured, people that were arrested, or people that had loved ones disappeared, they they are broken. They they some of them managed to to recover and rebuild themselves and go on to have successful careers, and many others uh, weren't. So those wounds will not heal, I guess, until those generations are no longer with us. But then you also have to look at intergenerational trauma. So I grew up in the Chilean Australian community and the discussions that were held at my dinner table when I was five, six, seven, eight years old were comparisons of torture stories. And that creates a intergenerational trauma. Now, I was lucky enough that my, my parents did not fall into becoming alcoholics or, or you know substance abuse but many other Chileans parents did and, and then their uh, children's lives were were destroyed or, or impacted so there 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 is a lot of of trauma which has taken place and unfortunately I don't think people will recover in, until those generations are no longer around Clinton do you have anything to add to that uh, no, I mean it's deeply moving to see uh, Rodrigo speaking so calmly, despite the yeah. uh, the obvious uh, personal uh, uh, you know effect this has had. Um, I, I would just uh, think we could also look at other things like Australia's role, but also mm. uh, it's important to not focus. Yes, of course, the morality is, is a bad thing, but I want to take the arguments of the the people who were behind the coup, and even today, you know, there's a significant minority of of people in Chile. Um, that claim the coup was necessary, that there wouldn't have been a Pinochet without an Allende. 
uh, and look at all the good that Pinochet did. And I, I, I want to actually address that matter rather than uh, focus only on the trauma, which is you know legitimate to do. So if you don't mind, I could just add that that part there. Um, uh, Chile is known um, as the birthplace of the neoliberal program, which is about austerity, the privatization, the selling off of state assets, um, austerity programs, uh, cutbacks on benefits, on, on welfare state, on social security, um, and of uh, uh, giving investors, private investors, more power even over governments. And so that model was spread to the rest of the world, at least the Western world, in the 1980s mm -hmm. and after the Soviet Union collapsed into Eastern Europe in the 1990s. Um, and of course, at the global financial crisis of 2008 is where it is normally believed that neoliberalism was proven to be a failure. Yep. Right? And today, you know, 15 years after the GFC, the global financial crisis of 2008, it's clear that it's been a failure because it's led to a very angry, atomized, insecure population that's pitted against each other, um, that, that you know can't plan for the future. They can't plan when they can, uh, you know, even whether they can have kids and get married because they don't know whether, when they're going to be able to work next. And that's a result of the neoliberal assault uh, mm -hmm. on societies. But I want to say that uh, as an economic historian, I mean, this is not controversial at all. Neoliberalism actually failed first in Chile, right? Pinochet's economic program failed. Uh, they brought in, it was perfect, perfect experimental conditions. Uh, there was no resistance because they, people were, you know, were disappeared and tortured and arrested and so on. Unions were not basically allowed to be free. Uh, and so there was just no resistance. And so in a perfect laboratory setting, the so-called Chicago boys came in. Yeah. This is the neoliberal <laughs> free market people. And they yeah. tried a whole bunch of, uh, you know, to, to get the economy moving. And they had a lot of help, don't forget. It's as Dr. Acuna said, um, you know, the, the hoarding stopped and all of a sudden the supplies were then brought in so people could go back to the supermarkets and get food, whereas in the past, under Allende, make the economy scream, they couldn't. So they had everything going for themselves, right? In five years' time, they crashed the economy, right? Yeah. And and so that's from 77 to about 82. By 82, the economy had crashed. The only thing that had not, not crashed was the copper company that Allende had nationalized, Codelco, right? That was the source of the, uh, of, the, of the state revenues, the major source. And so in economic history, there's a joke that this is actually the Chicago road, not to the free market. It's the Chicago road to state socialism because it's actually proven that the free market institutions, uh, you know, uh, left to their own devices, uh, will eat themselves up because they just eat the economy mm -hmm. and eat, eat society. And that's exactly what's happened in the, you know, in the world today. You see this angry population that's atomized that at each other's throat, and now it's 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 accelerated through social media and further technology. Uh, but really, the the economic insecurity that's driving so much resentment and anger and distrust of institutions that was proven to be false, a, a flawed model, not today but in Chile in 1982. So that's the point. I want to actually attack the, the uh, Pinochet model uh, in its own terms, not simply to, to focus only on the morality of it. That, that's my contribution, I would say. Yeah, look, um, I have to say that uh, I'm glad that you raised the Chicago School of Economic Philosophy and all that kind of thing, because yes, Chile was actually uh, at the uh, at the center of this grand experiment. But I suppose if one were a vengeful person on the system, one could say that now with the breakdown of you know, uh, economic rationalism as a, as a philosophy, uh, with people now starting to talk about universal basic income and various other economic models that are outside of that purview, and, and also with the breakdown of the um, globalist um, experiment, which also came from all of this. Yes. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, we're, we're looking at major, major ructions at the moment. And what happens as a consequence of all of this is we can sit back, look down, look down uh, the the uh, the TARDIS path, have a look at how Chile was managed during the Pinochet years and foretell that this was not going to work out well. But no one yeah. did. No one yeah. did. This is all the all the top economists at the Chicago School, Milton Friedman and his yep. disciples, you know, they had perfect experimental conditions. Mm. Uh, to implement their model, five yeah. years later it crashed. So that, mm. that's the, the the. I mean, there is another aspect to it, which is I'm sure you're going to get to, which is Australia's role. But I I, mm. I don't want to uh, to to leave people thinking that well, you know, um, 
you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs. That you have mm-hmm. to have some pain in order to have uh, you know better a better economy. The economy was worse after uh, Pinochet's Chicago Boys had gotten uh, had 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 spent five years on it. Is that also now, if I can, you know, pose this question, um, the difficulties that we've seen over the last couple of years in Chile, where there have been street protests, you know, is this also a consequence of failed economic policies that have not been able to be rooted out completely and and is also acting as a sort of magnet for the pro Pinochet mob, you know, who say, no, you know, Pinochet was a great guy and look what he did for the economy. You know, I mean, yeah, if you profited from the economy, great, you you did well. If you didn't, and the vast majority didn't, then of course, you know, you have another story to tell, right? Well, if, if I can just add to, to the point that Clinton, Clinton raised, he's completely right. And it reminded me of a uh, article, a lengthy article that Orlando Letelier, Allende's Minister for Foreign Affairs, wrote in, I think it was in The Nation in 1975. And he went through the economic policies which were being implemented and were already hurting Chileans. So he wrote a very powerful argument about how the economic policies that were being implemented by the Pinochet regime were actually not benefiting the majority of Chileans. Chileans were going to get poorer. Now, by the 1980s, the crisis was was quite uh, severe. And once Pinochet stepped down in the early, I think, 1990, 1991. The Chilean population was obviously jubilant. There was no longer a, a military dictatorship. And they were sucked into purchasing a whole bunch of credit cards. And they thought, OK, maybe now things are going to start looking up. But fast forward only a few years after that, and you're seeing again a return of industrial action, massive demonstrations, the birth of a radical student movement. That's where the current president comes from. And by 2019, the population, vast sectors of the population had had enough. Chile is the only country, my understanding, it is my understanding, that has privatized water. Now, that's fundamental. I mean, that's a human right. But it has privatized all other key other aspects of, of, of the economy. So by late 2019, when another increase in the metro uh, fares uh, occur, Santiago has a, a very large underground metro system, the, the students said, look, we've, we've, we've had enough. And they decided to take to the streets. And people supported them. And the next thing you know, within a few weeks, you have a social explosion, which became so large and even so violent that the Pineda administration declared martial law for two weeks and the military were called onto the streets. And again, uh, human rights abuses were were reported, the use of rubber bullets, hundreds of Chileans lost uh, a section of their, their eyesight. And that is a direct result to people resenting and and rejecting the the free market, the neoliberal economic model, because they are aware, despite the spin by media outlets like The Economist, and and, then, you know, except you can add a long list to to them, uh, they actually lived the 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 privatization program by the military dictatorships and the post-dictatorship governments. Wow. Okay. So guys, uh, we started off talking about Washington's role, American imperial objectives back in the 1970s, but how did Washington's desire to thwart leftist politics in Latin America generally, but in Chile in particular, play to Pinochet's coup against Allende? I mean, there was America's four-dimensional chess master at the time, Henry Kissinger, who was, as we know, US Secretary of State then. Does he bear any responsibility for events in Chile? I mean, it's, it's a difficult one to actually ask because... When you look at Chile, there were so many internal and external factors, push and pull factors, that to actually sit down and say, well, this event or this thing was fully and solely responsible for what happened in Chile would be incorrect, right? It's a yes. much more complicated situation. <clears throat> oh, look, I agree. Yeah. It's, it always is. And so here's the general mm-hmm. dynamic, and it happens in a number of places. <clears throat> in Indonesia, mm-hmm. 1965, yeah. there was a... Uh, a so-called coup and a foil coup, and basically it led to the destruction of uh, the Indonesian Communist Party, who were actually not a revolutionary party, but a party committed to advancing the interests of the poor within the system. 
And uh, that was done with the support of the Indonesian military and conservative, or I would say reactionary, um, uh, Islamic militias. Mm -hmm. But they could never have done that had it not been for the assistance given to them by the United States and by yep. Australia. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that um, the names of the of the people who had to be targeted and arrested and so on and disappeared were not in, were not collected by the Indonesian military or the or the Islamic militias. They were collected by the American embassy, and that's from their declassified cables. The American embassy's declassified cables actually say that these people have no idea, uh, seem to have little idea who to actually target. So we're giving them all this information. Anyway, that's uh, sort of what happened in, in Chile as well. But it goes beyond that. In every society, you will find you know, some people who want to preserve their own power, and they do that by collaborating with the imperial power. Yeah. So obviously... Uh, you know, slavery would never have happened without the total collaboration of uh, some slave communities in Africa on the coast, because they're the ones that actually went inland and got the uh, the slaves from the next community, and and then sold them to the to the uh, the people on the ships. Would take them to the yeah. to Brazil and to you know, to North America and places like that. Mm. So it's never the case that you know. These people have no agency. So that's not the claim that's been made. So what is the claim being made? The claim is that we know from the declassified record that uh, it, it was an attempt to firstly set up a brain drain in, in Chile. So the Australian embassy uh, put out uh, you know, information which was carried by the biggest newspaper in Chile at the time, uh, led by Augustine Edwards, who was like the Rupert Murdoch of Chile. Right? He's the media baron, totally mm -hmm. de dependent on the United States for his power. And they were trying to get an educated, technocratically, technologically qualified Chileans to leave the country, to emigrate to Australia, right? in order to make it hard for Allende's government to, um, uh, to, 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 run, to run the economy. Um, then there was a the question of wheat and beef. And so after the coup, uh, you know, the United States went to Australia and to Argentina, which was also under military dictatorship, and they, and they said, can you increase your sales of, of food just to make sure that it's there? But more than that, um, the, 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 the first coup the attempt, which is in 1970, which, which led to the, the murder of the Chilean chief of the defense force who refused to participate, that was an entirely a CIA operation. Yes, there were some Chileans who actually, you know, ambushed the car that he was in. Would not never have happened without, Nixon actually put this in his papers, but there's $10 million, go for it. That was, we have, we have the, Nixon's handwritten notes. Give $10 million, this is in September 1970, in order to start the coup. So yes, there is always a Chilean agency inside, but there is the United States there as well. And we now know that at every step of the way, in the whole from 1970 when the coup failed until 1973 when the actual coup succeeded, they constantly looked to the United States for guidance and reassurance that they would be protected. If anything went wrong, they would be exfiltrated and, and given asylum somewhere else. So that level of of, of involvement, uh, you know, was the was indispensable for the Chileans, the, the military to carry out the coup. That, that's the best way. I, I don't wish to, uh, you know, put all the blame on the United States because that's not the reality. But mm. in reality, the United, without the United States, the, they wouldn't, these, these guys would never have had uh, the, the, the mental focus and confidence or even the resources to do it. So how did um, the, the uh, deputy sheriff of the United States, Australia, play its role in all of this? Well, I, I don't want to talk too long, so because I want to give Dr. Acuna a chance to actually show Absolutely. his expertise, <laughs> but I'll be very quick. Um, the United States asked Australia to send the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, our external human intelligence agency, to set up a station in Chile in order to act as a go-between between the, the CIA itself and the coup plotters. Um, there was a sort of sense that uh, if the United States embassy were shut down, then they would be denied you know, some valuable base for operations in addition to whatever safe houses they had. So Australia going in there, which we already had an embassy, that would not have been a problem. And we set up uh, a safe house. We know from the, from, from the documents that we've declassified that they set up a safe house. They, we know they got, the, got a car, they bought a safe in the house. We even know the combination number of that safe. And we also know that there were ASIO officers. So I'm not talking about ASIS only, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service, but our counterintelligence agencies, an agency in Australia, the ASIO officers, were masquerading as immigration officers 
and were in our embassy in Chile. Right. And the immigration minister, Clyde Cameron, found this out in 1974. He, and he, he was shocked. What, what's going on, he said. You know, and even in 72, he you was know, in the, with the Whitlam in his time election victory. And he didn't want it to happen. He, thought, he was just couldn't understand why ASIO officers were masquerading as immigration officers in his portfolio and were posed, posing, uh, posted to an embassy. Well, unfortunately, and I'll end my point here, uh, we do know why. Okay, there were credible allegations raised in Parliament, even in 1985, that there were people in Chile who would come to the Australian Embassy and apply for for humanitarian assistance or yeah. protection of some sort, um, and they were then betrayed to the Chilean secret police. So we we know the names of of two of those people, David and Marcelo Mino Logan, M I N O dash Logan. Mm. Um, they'd been given entry to Australia in a special humanitarian program. But in our embassy, along with the Asia officers who were there, was a locally employed Chilean woman who was a relative of the head of the Ch Chilean secret police. And so those brothers, having been identified, they confided all their, you know, their personal information to, to our embassy. They were then betrayed to the Chilean secret police and they were executed. And this happened to a lot of people, we believe. And so that's that's sort of uh, our role as well. So it's not just the ACES, it's the Asia officers. As well. So... Were, were Australian authorities actually acting on behalf of the United States? I mean, is that how it worked? Or was there um, was there a sovereign Australian reason for why we interfered in the way that we did? We can answer yeah. that question very easily. Uh, right. No, um, there was no reason, no sovereign Australian reason. It was basically in order to assist the United States. Uh, and right. we know that. I mean, that, right. that even came from the head of ACES. The right. head of ACES briefed Gough Whitlam, uh, mm. Bill Robertson. Uh, and he told Whitlam, Look, we, when Whitlam got elected, firstly, he told Whitlam, we've got something called ACES because the, the opposition leader was not told about the existence of ACES, mm. right? ACES' existence was never formally acknowledged until 1977 when Malcolm Fraser made a statement in parliament. So when Whitlam came in, he was in 1972, he suddenly was told, we've got something called ACES. Here are where the stations are. And by the way, we're running an operation in Chile. Uh, we, and Robertson tells him, sign, this, sign this, this, this order and we withdraw the station. And we'll sort it out with the Americans. You don't need to worry about that. Whitlam said, no, uh, we, I don't want to, I don't want to, I can't justify it. But on the other hand, I don't want to give the CIA the wrong impression. So basically, there was no Australian interest in that sense, no. Okay. Okay, Rodrigo, I mean, it's amazing. What role did amnesty laws play in protecting former perpetrators of human rights violations under the Pinochet regime? And how has this impacted justice and accountability generally? Once Pinochet stepped down in 1990, he tied the system in. So he became, he continued to remain the head of the Chilean armed forces until 1998. Yeah. And he became what was called a senador vitalicio, a senator for life. Now, he never actually attended the Chilean Senate, but there was a seat there and there was a little plaque where that's where he, that was his seat. So it was a, a reminder to the general population that uh, I may have stepped down, but I'm still around and I don't want any of my my boys to be to be touched unless it's sort of, you know, um, sort of the public pressure was enormous. So the head of the Dino was was arrested. And yes, they went after some some figures uh, in the first few years. But for almost, uh, in fact, over over a decade, uh, many, many key figures of the regime were not touched precisely because the armed forces uh, remained loyal to to the Pinochet uh, philosophy. And it wasn't until Pinochet was actually arrested in London in the late 1990s, he was there for some, some back surgery, and a Spanish uh, judge, uh, Garzón, he decided to um, uh, request his extradition to Spain because there were some Spaniards that were killed during the coup. There were many, many foreigners that were actually killed in Chile during during the coup and then then after. And uh, then the British legal system and the political establishment found themselves in a very in in quite an uncomfortable situation where you had this uh, former head of a mil of a brutal military regime. Who has now, uh, you know, there, there is a there is a, a warrant for his his arrest. 
So they arrested him and then his uh, lawyers argued that he was too old and he couldn't remember anything. They used all sorts of excuses and then the House of Lords was involved and a lot of back and forth. But eventually he, he was released. And once he returned to Chilean soil, I only saw the interview again. Uh, a few days ago, he gave an interview to a journalist in uh, Miami uh, of Cuban heritage, and his memory was he's, he was fine. He was sharp, and in fact, he he once he he stepped off the off the airplane in Santiago when he arrived. He made a point to get up out of his wheelchair and to indicate to the to the ultra right in Chile that he could still walk and and he was okay. So, uh, and and the final point is that the Chilean judicial system as well was tied into the military. So that judicial system, those judges were were, were connected to to the regime. And in again, the, roughly the same year, I think nineteen ninety seven or nineteen ninety eight, ninety nine, there was a Chilean journalist, a brave Chilean journalist called Alejandra Matus, and she exposed the connections between the Chilean judicial system at the time to the military regime, and her book was banned and there was an arrest warrant issued there was a, there was a arrest warrant issued for for her arrest and she ended fleeing the the country and, and returned to i think canada or the united states she's one of the most respected journalists in the country but at the time she had to flee um and she had to and her, and her book was not published it was published as sort of a, on the in the black market um and and this is almost 10 years after the dictatorship is has ended just continuing on uh, that thought, um, current Chilean president, and forgive my pronunciation, uh, is it uh, Gabriel Boric? Because it Correct. sounds like a Slavic. Yeah, okay. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, okay. Um, so President Gabriel Boric recently initiated a plan to clarify the circumstances of the, disappearing, uh, the disappeared victims and grant access to information. Can you explain the significance of this policy change and its potential impact? Well, it's 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 still trying to to conclude that 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 period of Chilean history, because the as I said before, the Chilean judicial system was dragging its feet. It was still too connected to the military regime. So yes, there were figures of the regime which were put on trial and they were they were incarcerated, uh, but there were many others that that uh, that were not. And, and that's what this process is about. It's about still trying to hold those people accountable and still trying to, while they are alive, to try and find information and, and possibly the, the remains of the, of the disappeared. Uh, Clinton, if I could ask you, what do you think is the trust that average Chileans have in their national security forces, but particularly the army, following all of the egregious crimes that have been committed under the Pinochet regime how and and how does how does that how does that actually work you know I mean it's hard for someone in Australia not having lived that experience to understand that kind of uh, uh splitting a part of the of the nation state so much so that one of its key institutions has turned against its people and then after all is said and done you don't have any option you've got to you know for your own national security, perspective you need to trust and rehabilitate that institution otherwise you don't have a military or you don't have intelligence forces so how does that all work i'll uh, I'll, I'll defer to dr acuna for his uh, thing about chilean public opinion but i will say this um it's not just chile uh you know there was a there was a number of of military dictatorships yeah. uh, in in latin america that have had to deal with this problem and it starts in like in 1954 you know, with uh, with the coup of the 1964 in Brazil, and then of course uh, Bolivia, even before Chile, and then Chile itself, and then later on Peru and and uh, and, and elsewhere. It's called the Southern Cone. It was yeah. full of coups, right? Um, well, to a large extent, and this is you know something that ties into something that you asked me before. Once September 11, 2001 happened, the Bush administration, George Bush the son. Uh, fought the war on terror and all the effort, you know, almost all the military and intelligence effort and, and so on went into the Middle East and into Afghanistan and so on. And as a result, uh, the Chilean and the other Latin American militaries lost the attention of the their biggest patron, namely the United States. So at the time when, when Bush was somehow accused, sometimes accused of, of neglecting Latin America, that's the time at which their power weakened, right? And so in many Latin American countries, 
uh, there was a, a what they call a pink tide, a kind of a wave of democ democratization that began to occur, precisely because America's attention, imperial attention, went elsewhere. And if you look at the war on terror and the black sites where people were extraordinarily kid were kidnapped, called, it's called extraordinary rendition. Mm -hmm. uh, they were kidnapped and they were tortured in order to extract information. There was not a single black site in Latin America. They were all in Poland and yeah. uh, and in the Middle East. You know, clients like uh, the uh, Mubarak in Egypt and Egypt, uh, yeah. uh, and Assad uh, in in mm. Syria uh, before he you know fell out with the United States as well. And mm. so there was not a single black site, torture site in 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 Latin America, not just in Chile. So in that sense, the people in the in the junta that that were in the seventies and fifties, sixties, seventies, they're now old or dead, right? And so it's a new generation. And ultimately, I guess they still feel they're all Chilean, so they have to come to terms with that. But that, that is an important calculation, that the imperial patron's attention was, was, was diverted. Dr. Acuna would, would probably be able to say more about Chilean public opinion. Well, in terms of Chilean public opinion towards the, the military and the carabineros, the militarized police force, uh, the, the polls have long been shocking. Uh, the, the, the trust in those institutions um, uh, have, have plummeted. Um, and especially with the the influx of the the, the drug trade, uh, which was not really at present on a street level in Chile, now the carabineros have become quite corrupt, and you have a, a, a narco culture developing in in Chile, and that's precisely because of corrupt elements within the within the armed forces and within the police. And there have been uh, members who have written about this and, and, and been, you know, critiquing and saying, we, look, we, we really need to clean this up because we're going to become uh, possibly another Mexico. Um, now, in terms of how that's uh, the public opinion and, and, and how the institutions are viewed, um, by the the general Chilean public, the current minister for of, of defense is actually uh, a lady called Maya Allende, and Maya Allende is actually Salvador Allende's uh, daughter, uh, and she was given that portfolio precisely to try and and boost uh, confidence in the armed forces and to try and and, and democratize them. Now. The Carabineros, part of the Boric government's uh, agenda originally, was to dismantle the Carabineros. People want to see that militarized police force them dismantled and 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 something uh, better and 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 far more democratic uh, replaced. But he has capitulated to the pressure by those institutions and the political right. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like the Carabineros will be dismantled. But again going back to public opinion, the public opinion of them is so poor that they're actually having problems recruiting people. And that's despite the fact that for Latin American standards, the Carabineros are probably one of the least corrupt police forces and have probably one of the better standards of living throughout Latin America. If, if you were to join a police force in Latin America, you probably want to join the Carabineros because you would have uh, a health plan, a good retirement plan, all those sorts of deals. So it, it, it's interesting how those institutions are viewed and how they are operating and how the, the, the political battle that's taking place uh, over them. I'll add as well the the, the concept of trying to to democratize uh, these institutions now and and the connection to to the United States. So there have been calls within Latin America in Bolivia for all ties with the United States at an institutional military level to be cut. And the reason is because of this, if you go back to the School of the Americas and how they have these, I guess you could call them sleeper agents. So when they want to carry out a coup d'etat, the political right will get together with the US ambassador and they'll carry out their usual lobbying, and then they can call upon these people. So there have been calls for uh, alternative institutions to be established, the Union of South American Nations, uh, which was uh, founded in 2008. Uh, they were talking about these uh, sorts of ideas. And, and and there is a push to, to, to have those uh, institutional links either cut completely or, or significantly reduced because there have been too many cases in Latin America where the United States has been has been able to find uh, members of the of the armed forces that have been all too happy and willing to cooperate with them in carrying out coup d'etats.
Interesting. You know, the just listening to you guys talk, uh, I'm I'm kind of reminded of a sort of pattern of Cold War politics that played out from Iran in the early 1950s when we had the you know the Americans interfere to get rid of Mossadegh. And then you ended up with the problems in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Then, of course, you had all of the problems that we're talking about right now in Chile and Latin America generally as well. It seems that the Americans were playing to a particular um, model of you know, foreign interference, shall we say. And actually, it was interesting because when you were mentioning uh, the Whitlam government, for instance, we also know that the Americans were not too pleased with uh, Prime Minister Whitlam and may have had a slight hand in his ouster as well. So <laughs> whether you happen to be a friend, a foe or sitting on the fence, you know, you got to be careful of those Americans. <laughs> but God, I don't know. Well, you know, they, they, as you know, listen, you're, you're a you know, the expert in this field as well. But uh, the United States, when they were planning for the post-war world, mm. uh, they quite explicitly decided to learn from the British. I mean, that's actually in their planning documents and in the memoirs. So John uh, George Kennan, for example, in his yeah, book, that's right. American, yeah. Yeah, American Diplomacy, you know, mm. he actually says, what we got to do is learn from the British mm. because we can't physically control a country. We can't physically rule uh, countries like the way the Brit British ruled, say, India, or France ruled India or China. But we have to have control over their, their sovereignty anyway. How do we do that? We've got to do it indirectly, right? And But the, but the, but the British uh, aim was quite explicit, you know. And, and look, it goes right back to Australia, the founding of Australia, European settlement here. At the very same time that the first and second fleets were coming to Australia, Britain was also in control of Bengal, which is today Bangladesh. It was a very rich country. And they put in place a system whereby landlords would run the society for them with British force in the background and sometimes in the foreground. But they always rely on an intermediary, an indigenous intermediary to run the society because there aren't that many British people compared to say people from Bengal. And so that model of trying to find a client uh, who, who is repressive enough to handle most problems directly, but with imperial force in the background, was the British model of governance. And it is what the Americans learned. And in Latin America, that, that's the reason why there's been so many coups. Uh, in the past, there were people who were blaming it on Catholicism because it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's a very Catholic country. You know, the, the Catholics yeah. had all these coups, but then all of a sudden you find the coup happening in Greece, which is absolutely not Catholic. Uh, and it's the same dynamic. Um, mm. But in, and so, th so that's the that's the general idea that they had to learn um, from the British, and they what they needed was an intermediary, an indigenous intermediary to run the society, and that neo-colonial kind of indirect control is is the basic preferred model. Actually, it's really interesting you say that because, of course, there there is some um, historical evidence, or at least there there are British historians who have suggested quite strongly that um, Latin America was an indirect extension of British power in spite of the Monroe Doctrine and they that the British had undue influence over many Latin American countries after they had uh, declared their independence from Spain. And yes. I think that that must have also been a thorn in the side of the Americans as they were trying to establish some form of control over Latin America yes. during the early 1900s. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So just so basically the Monroe Doctrine is from 1823. So this is the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine as well this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was aspirational. At the time, America did not have the, the military or the naval power uh, yeah. to expel Britain. And the largest foreign investor in Argentina, you know, with, which developed the, the beef industry and, and uh, uh, the primary sector in Argentina was British investments. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and so it took a while for them to kick Britain out of Latin America, but they eventually did it. Uh, mm. But definitely, um, you know, you, as usual, your grasp of history is incomparable. And so, yeah, uh, Britain was, in fact, the, <laughs> I've never seen actually, I don't know any radio hosts who ask these sorts of questions. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for that, Clinton. <laughs> anyway, look, I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. And from Sydney and Darwin, Australia, we're speaking with Dr. Rodrigo Acuna and Professor Clinton Fernandez on Chile, 50 years on from the Pinochet coup. Now, how has the international community reacted to Chile's efforts to address the legacy of the Pinochet regime, particularly with regards to human rights violations? You know, the European Union, for instance, you know, they put a lot of stock on trying to act as the world's moralizers, while the Americans kind of look like the West's 
uh, you know, bobble boys, effectively. So, um, you know, what have the Europeans brought to the equation in terms of trying to broker a sense of healing and a sense of, well, okay, yeah, you had your Pinochet, but now it's all going well. Have they had any role whatsoever? Um, Look, I I, I think you you need to look at the different sectors of society. So if you're looking at uh, the, the the trade unions, if you're looking at the human rights organizations, if you're looking at lawyers with which deal with these sorts of issues, their, their, their positions and their efforts have been nothing but absolutely amazing. Uh, committed researchers, et cetera, et cetera. The list is, 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 is too long. They have provided an enormous amount of support towards democratizing Chile, towards uh, human rights. There were a group of uh, doctors, I think, in Sweden, which started a very important organization during the social uprising of 2019. And they uh, put out an, a, a large amount of video footage of the human rights violations which were taking place. Now, if you look at the uh, at an institutional level, they certainly will p- pay lip service to uh, democratization and human rights in Latin America. Mm-hmm. But I find it interesting that the there has never been a Latin American dictator general which has ended up at the Hague, um, <laughs> and yeah. there's a very good reason for that. If you ever ended if if if, if a general Pinochet or a Videla. Uh, or the goons in uh, El Salvador or Guatemala ended up at the Hague, and they started talking. Then the level of embarrassment in Washington would explode, um, mm. and that's precisely why they're not that, that. You know, they've never been taken there. I, I'm, 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 I'm assuming, and I think it's a it's a reasonable, educated mm. guess. Um, so there. The, the the rhetoric is well yes we we support human rights and we support tr- transparency um but but in terms of supporting this process on the ground i mean the 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 man who pulled the trigger and killed the chilean folk singer victor jara he's been living comfortably in miami there's a netflix documentary about him and he's been living there for for many decades uh adriana rivas who is a former dinner intelligence agent she entered australia in 1978 she's wanted for seven murders in chile since 2007 and she was arrested. She fled Chile and, and and returned to Australia. Was working here as a as a nanny and as a as a, as, a, as a cleaner. She was only arrested in 2019 after a huge campaign by the Chilean Australian community. We managed to raise uh, over 600 signatures and get members of of the Senate uh, to support us in having her extradition request. Uh, you know her, her her the warrant which was put out by Interpol, um, having having that uh, enacted, and that's why she was arrested and she's currently sitting in a prison in a Sydney prison, but now after fifteen months of her no longer defending herself through the Australian judicial system, we're still waiting for the Attorney General to to give the green light for her to be sent to Chile and be put on trial. Marcia Tambuti Allende, the granddaughter of President Allende, mentioned mixed feelings about the 50-year commemoration of the Pinochet coup. Would it not just be better to forgive and forget to prevent opening old wounds, or would Chile have benefited from a South African-style truth and reconciliation process? We had a, a South African style truth and, pre- and reconciliation process, but as I mentioned before, it, it just it never went uh, far enough, mm. and as I said before as well, there are certain boundaries that you that you don't cross. So imagine, I mean, how many parents have been in the situation where they've briefly lost the toddler in uh, in the in the in the supermarket for five minutes, uh, mm-hmm. and the 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 pain and grief that they be, that they experience. Now imagine losing uh, your one of your loved ones uh, for decades and never knowing where where they are. Uh, in Argentina, in Argentina, it, it uh, was quite common for the children of the political prisoners to then be adopted by members of the armed forces. So on the one hand, the armed forces have murdered their parents. And on the other hand, members of the armed forces who can't have children themselves are, are, are adopting 
uh, those children. Now, once those children, some of them found out what their background was, they broke off all contact with their parents. Others refused to meet the their their relatives, their original relatives, and just said, "Look, it's 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 a lie. They, these are nothing but uh, you know left wing propaganda lies, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So I don't think those wounds really will heal, and and I, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I just don't think those wounds can ever completely heal um on, on a on a on a personal and on a wider sort of societal level and and then you've got the the institutions so if uh chile had moved on from the pinochet dictatorship we would not have had the social explosion of of 2019 which saw the country paralyzed for several months and uh thousands of people uh injured and wounded from police and military repression you know as an australian of course this is a matter for the chileans to handle you know but mm -hmm. what what can we do um, in the first instance, uh, we should accept that other than the names of the ASIO and ACES officers, everything should be declassified. Yeah. There is no national security question that's going to harm the Australian people 50 years later uh, mm. by keeping th those records secret. Uh, as a South Australian, you know, your leading senator is Senator Wong, who is also the yeah. foreign minister. And it's up to her to not duck shove the matter to the National Archives, which is the technical term, but to actually make a decision, show leadership as the foreign minister, mm -hmm. and take proactive steps to declassify foreign affairs records to show who was in the embassy, in our embassy, in our, you know, in, in Chile. Uh, not the names of our ASIO or ACES officers, because they should always be kept secret. However, the information that they had, who, who were the Chileans who were coming to the embassy asking for protection? What information was, was shared about that? All of those details remain classified, but there is no, that this is not national security in any meaningful sense for Australia. And so whatever the Chileans decide to do, the truth and reconciliation or justice and so on, we as Australians have our own, our own options mm -hmm. and we should be declassifying those records with the appropriate caveats. I would agree with that. But uh, of course, we know from uh, the American experience with the John F. Kennedy assassination, so and so many decades after the assassination, again, no major national security uh, issue at stake here. Why don't they declassify what went on, I should say? You know, it's now still an area shrouded in conspiracy. It should not be. And arguably, you're exactly right. I mean, we should be able to be having this discussion and, and freeing that information out there for the historical record. Yeah, but, ironically, the United States has declassified about 16,000 records on Chile. Yeah. The IA records. Well, you yeah. know, uh, as, as, as a direct, at, at the direct request of the Chilean government, they did, began to do that and they, and they kept doing that. And we should mm. do the same. I mean, there's no reason why we have to hold on to this stuff. It's 50 years old. What, 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 the only reason to hold on to this is to protect the intelligence agencies from, uh, from the public, from a democratic debate as to how the agency should be used. Right. Yeah. The security protects them. It doesn't actually protect Australia. But I mean, you and I both know that Australians generally are very apathetic lot. Would we would we be fired up about, you know, th this kind of revelation today, 50 years after the coup? You know, I mean, so much time has passed. Australians never really, you know, galvanize around a passionate topic or uh, yeah, what 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 point will that serve? You know, just playing devil's advocate. Absolutely. No, no, I, I please go as hard as you like. Um, mm. We do know that when the truth is sometimes told, it just breaks out sometimes. Yeah. Uh, people are rightly outraged. Now, they do have other commitments. They do have to, you know, earn a living and look after their family mm. and pay the mortgage and so on. Um, mm. But uh, in the case of Timor, for example, as soon as the, the leaked materials started coming out, yeah. uh, people were absolutely outraged and they got in the streets. Uh, there's a very good book uh, by Nick Joes, J-O-S-E, called The Idealist. Uh, he's just published it. I think it's going to be released next month. And it's precise. It's a fiction book. It's just, it's about that. It's about the, the sacrifice of a of an intelligence officer uh, who revealed information and and, and which, which created public uh, concern. What about the, the war crimes in Afghanistan? Uh, you know, once the public sees this, they are repelled by it. Now, of course, they expect the institutions to work. And if the institutions don't work, you can't expect the individual member of the public to get angry by themselves. Uh, but we do know from from experience that once they are told about the reality, they don't like it. They oppose it. Yeah. OK, uh, Clinton and Rodrigo, there have been concerns expressed about the continued support for Pinochet's legacy within Chile's right wing parties. Can you elaborate on the political dynamics and the potential for a return to authoritarianism? 
authoritarianism as authoritarianism has has um as as a as a political uh philosophy has certainly had a a, a broader appeal in the last few years in chile they they almost started to run out of of arguments the the economic argument um was one they used to make the argument that uh, yes there were excesses under the general but at least he wasn't corrupt like those central american dictators until over 20 million dollars were found right. in us uh, bank right. accounts um and uh so they they they've been running out of out of arguments but of course they have an ally a very important ally which is the media in in chile and the media the mercurio which is the country's leading newspaper the the head of El mercurio at the time of the allende government he went to washington and he's he's actually the only uh chilean um from from that sector which which had direct meetings with the cia that was that was uh, peter combo i was listening to him recently at the national security archive and um his uh, newspaper then promoted the idea that uh, the and the government was weak and something needed to be to be done so the and and, and the mercurio has never apologized for that it uh, it supported the, the the dictatorship for 17 years and there are other sectors of the chilean media which support these types of arguments so on the one hand a lot of chileans are aware that it's one of the most privatized countries in the world they took to the streets they recognized that uh, the country's constitution which was established under the military dictatorship it needs to change but then once the social uh, unrest uh, calmed down then uh, then protesters went back home then they have been buying into many of these of, of these arguments that uh, chile or chileans at their core are a people that are unruly and we need a, a strong man or we need uh someone with a with a with a vision and is going to get the you know get everyone into into line and the gentleman that came close to winning the president the last presidential election uh it was quite embarrassing for him because he was connected his brother was a minister uh under pinochet and his grandfather was a card-carrying member of the Nazis. So, <laughs> you know, if you want to look for connections between the Chilean right, you you can look for them, and and they go right back to 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 the Nazis in Germany. Yeah, let's not even bring up Argentina, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, guys, do you think that enough attention is placed on Latin America as a potential place of interest for Australia? Have the recent influx of immigrants from Latin America made any substantial difference to how Australia sees Latin America generally, especially out of part in the foreign affairs and trade? And the reason why I ask this question is that when we were lucky enough, at Sage International, we were lucky enough to get a... Uh, a research grant from the Australian Department of Defence, we went on a research trip uh, to Canberra and we wanted to address the notion of the Indo-Pacific and the strategic dynamics therein. Um, we got great responses from all the embassies that we reached out to. Strangely enough, the Latin Americans were front and centre but my colleague and I, uh, we didn't get the best of receptions because we had 12 Latin American ambassadors sitting around the table grilling us, thinking that we were from DFAT, from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, criticizing the institution of our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for basically only putting two sentences on Latin America, an entire continent with about 300 million people, two sentences in the importance of Australia's foreign policy. Now, I mean, I understand that Australia has a limited understanding of many things, but you know, when it comes to having that sort of sophisticated ability to reach out to the rest of the region, a region by which we are trying to recreate, you know, this notion of the Indo-Pacific, well, certainly Latin America is part of that frame. You know, it may be a geographically distant and removed part of it, but the fact that we just don't pay no attention, and again, it comes back to, you know, let's look at Chile and let's look at Australia's position uh, and what we did and why we don't know anything about what we did. I mean, the ignorance is astounding, but that really comes from the fact that we just don't pay that continent much attention. Uh, have, have the 
have the local migrant communities that have come from Latin America, is that sort of changing it at least at a public level, at a, a more popular level? Uh, well, I can address uh, just at the policy level. Yeah. Um, we are, in fact, investing in in a diplomatic presence, but in the mining related areas. Uh -huh. uh, and, and in <laughs> fact, uh, so so the Indo-Pacific is obviously, you know, where half of Latin America uh, mm -hmm. is involved because uh, you know, the, the Latin American giant like Brazil is not a part of the Pacific, it's part of the mm -hmm. Atlantic. Um, but certainly Ecuador, where Hancock uh, prospecting the Gina Reinhardt private vehicle, uh, you know, does have interests in, in mm -hmm. Ecuador. Uh, and also in Chile, which is now very, very important because of the lithium resources, mm -hmm. you know, and, the, and the, the the mining that's going on at very high altitudes, uh, you know, is something that's regarded as perhaps important for the for the renewable energy transition. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also environmentally, you know, quite uh, brutal. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking about you know, you know dry areas with not much, not much water, but you need all get get the water out in order to get the lithium. Yeah. Uh, and so at that level, yes, there there is interest, but I don't know about the, the Latin American diaspora uh, in Australia. I leave that to Rodri. Well, the Chilean community historically is uh, has been one of the largest communities in, in in Australia. And certainly the presence or their presence, our presence, um is 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 you know, I mean we we've we've long reached out to and had many uh, political allies, uh, as I said before, the trade union movement, uh, progressive politicians, and, and they've been supportive of us, for example, in our efforts to extradite uh, Adriana uh, Ribas. Uh, in terms of uh, DFAT, I, I would agree with Clinton that its focus is mainly on mining and and, and economic interest. And while those, are, those interests are, are certainly important, um, the 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 rest of um, DFAT, the information that they release, I've I've actually cr criticised them, and uh, publicly uh, there was a meeting held a, a few years ago that I attended, and I proposed to them that um, that uh, could they please update their profile on latin america on latin american countries because their information was actually inaccurate it was very broad and it was creating um complications for university students to to travel there because of the, of, the, of the complexity so for example what, what i'm talking about is for example there are some cities in latin america which are extremely safe they, they, they have a very low crime rate um they, they're perfectly safe for foreigners to travel e even if they have very little knowledge of spanish now there are other cities which are, are certainly quite dangerous and, and you need to be well aware where you're going you need a good understanding of the language mm -hmm. um and i just said to them you know is, is it possible for you guys to please update your 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 website and, and specifically be a little bit more detailed in your your information because it's um it's a problem for for, for student visas and even at times yeah. for for academics to travel it just it just complicates things and, and, it, and, that, and that shouldn't be the case yeah absolutely okay guys last question i've saved the best for last i think okay Anthropologist and author Jared Diamond said that Chile had a thriving democratic tradition before it fell into dictatorship, a century of, and a half of democracy, in fact. But according to Diamond, Chileans began hardening political positions in the years prior to the coup and forgot the art of compromise. Do you think that Chile's experience serves as a good example in what can go wrong in an established democracy? I'll just take that. Uh, Jared Diamond, uh, do you know what his uh, speciality is? Anthropology. It's the gallbladder. That's what his PhD is. Ah, guns, oh, okay. guns, guns, germs, and steel. He's not an economic historian at all. Mm. Uh, uh, it, the, 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 the claims he's made have actually been criticized quite heavily, but inside the technical economic journals. His speciality wow. is, on, is on the gallbladder. It's actually mm. in biology. It's not at all about... Okay. So uh, the, the other claims about, about technology, look, he's written his book, which I've read, right, mm. um, about the backwardness of, uh, say, African societies and so on. All that is, is, is he's looking at the surface. Not a single mention of the fact that it was the colonial experience that created the backwardness. So it's not as though, um, say, the Chileans lack the ideas of what to do, or the Argentinians, or the Ecuadorians, or uh, lack ideas, or India, for example, under Britain, uh, but rather they were forcibly deindustrialized. So the, that level of power as emanating from the West 
has always been missing. There's not a single sentence of that in Jared Diamond's guns, germs and steel. Now, as for the thing, yes, of course, they, uh, this is, he's describing the tension in the 50s and 60s, um, especially in the 60s, uh, about the importance of get, Chileans getting control of their own natural resources. And the lack of compromise he's talking about is in fact the oligarchs who are in cahoots with the American corporations in Anaconda and Kennecott. Uh, and they rely for their own oligarchic position on Chile being dependent on just producing raw materials to send to the United States and to Europe so that they can manufacture advanced stuff and then you know, uh, remain dependent. So, so it's not as though a lack of compromise or lack of ideas uh, it, it, it is, is behind the, um, the developments in Chile, but the enforced power emanating from the imperial center with the collaboration of elite elements in Chilean society that leads to the polarization. That's my take on it. Uh, just on that, uh, the, the yeah. book that I was actually referring to from, from that little grab was uh, his latest book called Upheaval. And in that, he did make the claim that, you know, prior to Chile falling over into dictatorship, it was an active and established democracy, actually the only democracy in Latin America, according to Diamond. Yes. Now, uh, if that were the case, the point was raised, and I think it's a valid point to 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 put forward because of all the trouble that democracies around the world are currently facing at the moment, and arguably all of those troubles relate back to what we were talking about before, the Milton Friedman Chicago School style economic model, which is failing everywhere, and of course can't underpin democracy, because the widening gap between the rich and the poor, between the haves and the have-nots, you know, th these are now pre-revolutionary times that we're, we're, we're living through, and I don't think we're going to come out well, and we just have to look at the United States under the Trump presidency to see that what we would have considered the imperial center, the center for democracy in the West, that was quite easily seem to almost fall over on January 6th, you know, on the January 6th effort. And, um, you know, again, how does Chile's experience in terms of having been an active democracy and then going into dictatorship and a, a full polarization of society, how does that as a model affect the rest of us? Because surely there are lessons to be learned. And I think that that's what Diamond was trying to sort of put forward in, in, in upheaval at least, yeah? Okay, I haven't read upheaval, but mm. let's look at Chile. 1950s, 1960s, yes, Chileans had the right to vote. They had the formal trappings of democracy. It wasn't compulsory voting like Australia, but they had yeah. the right to vote. Um, but what, what, what the system relied on was political quietude, people accepting their lot in life. And if you're born poor, that, that's the way it's going to be. That's the way God planned it. That's, that's just life, right? Is that a Catholic so, thing? Is that a Catholic thing, Rodrigo? I, I think it had a lot to do with no. the reactionary nature of the Catholic Church. Yeah, yes, yes. You know, yes. And in fact, uh, uh, mm. the, the Vatican, you know, uh, John Paul II, mm. uh, he was very good on, on Soviet repression, very mm. bad no. on Latin American repression. Yeah. Uh, you know, he opposed attempts by ordinary people to change their lives. So yes, what Diamond is talking about is in fact the political quietude and the defeatism of the 50s and 60s. And once that began to end, that's actually, technically, it codes in, polit in American political science, it codes as upheaval, mm. right? Mm. Yeah. But in that case, any attempt at democracy, 1830s Britain, uh, the Chartists demanding the right to vote, is upheaval. Yeah. Uh, unless one, one accepts permanent quietude and accepting one's fate, doing nothing to change it, um, that might satisfy the conventions of American political science because they code as upheaval and not upheaval based on strike or not a strike or protest or not a protest. Uh, but um, uh, it's, the, it's the resistance to democracy that caused the coup. It wasn't the demands of Chileans for a better life that caused the coup. Can I can I just add just a, a little bit on, on on Chilean history? The the argument made that Chile was a, a stable democracy. Um, yes, there are merits to that argument. Yes, it was a, a stable uh, a democracy until uh, certain sectors of the st population started to demand more. But um, it was a stable democracy within Latin American 
history within the Latin American yeah. context. So if you go back to the late uh, 1920s, early 1930s, there was actually a, a, a military regime uh, in power in, in Chile. And if you go back even further to the late uh, 1800s, there was actually a civil war in Chile uh, where the president uh, ended up committing uh, suicide. And that civil war was precisely over the, the control of the country's resources. And that part of Chilean history was a part that President Allende referred to many times that he did not want to see a division of the armed forces. And he did not want to see a replay of that aspect uh, of, of, of Chilean history. Now, if you go, if you move forward to the 1940s and, and, and 50s, what you see there is that, yes, the, the United States is now able to, to influence and expand its power to the southern cone. They had been doing that. Washington had been doing that uh, in, in the late 1800s in uh, the Caribbean and, and in Central America. But uh, now they're able to, you know, what, what they say uh, matters in Santiago, in Buenos Aires, in, in Montevideo. So that's why they played a, a, a far more active role. And, and that's why the, the, the Chilean uh, elites and, and the hard right were able to travel to Washington, put in their complaints and obtain their support. And as Clinton says, that support was, was vital. Uh, for them to to carry out a, a successful coup d'etat. And if you look through the, the diplomatic uh, cables during many uh, 20th century uh, coups in, in Latin America, that's my area of interest, um, one thing that constantly comes up is the, the question, what will, you know, how long will it take for Washington to recognize us? That's a key concern by the the generals in, in Latin America that are carrying out coup d'etats. And, and when are they going to recognize us? And if Washington's not going to recognize us first, well, then who's going to recognize us? And, you know, if it's if it's the Brazilians that are doing it, that is that because they've had conversations with with the U.S. ambassador? And, and you know, and after that, you, do, do you promise that after that you will then recognize us? And, and they're very, very sensitive to that because if you go back to the early 20th century, when, for example, in Argentina, there were coups, these were um more sort of personal rivalries and and different you know factions um but once you once you move into the the 1940s and 50s onwards the coups that are taking place they're not power plays between different uh generals and and elite uh, economic interests these mm. are coups that uh, have been discussed and planned uh, with the support of the United States and and, and what Washington has, has to say now it really matters. And that was definitely the case in Chile. Rodrigo and Clinton, thank you both for joining us today and for sharing your insights on The Focus. John, thank you as always. It's uh, you know, Nobody gets out of your show without a, a detailed explanation and a, and a discussion. It is not, it is not uh, the, the intellectual work that has to be done to, to keep up with you is, uh, is unique. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And to our audience, thanks for tuning into the Focus podcast. We hope that you found today's discussion enlightening and thought-provoking. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to reach out to us on social media. You can find the Focus on Facebook, referenced on the John Bruni and Sage International LinkedIn pages, and on Twitter or on the Sage International website, sageinternational.com.au, by clicking the media drop-down menu and hitting podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and or leave us a review on your favorite platform. My thanks to our stalwart production team of Malcolm Hughes and Neil Smart and to the team of the Ozcast Network. Join us again next time as we continue to delve into the most pressing current affairs issues of our time. Until then, stay informed and stay engaged. I'm John Bruni, and from Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to The Focus. Mm -hmm.